Okay, I'll share my screen. Oops, come on. Share my screen. Is it shared? Can you guys see my, Brad, can you see my screen? Oh, I can look at it in my other. Okay, let's see. Hopefully it comes up. Great. Okay, there's my screen. Okay, so let's clear this. Okay, now. Can you make uh, Yeah, I will make the font bigger. Let's see. Can people see that? I guess I could make it one step bigger. Okay. So I am in um, examples 3D hex 8 in the pilot distribution. And so that's what I'm going to use for all these tests. Um, and so I, w I wish there was a way to like show the slide and show me running this stuff, but I'm not sure there is. So we'll just, we'll get along with this. So the first thing I want to do is, <clears throat> so I'm going to run this step 10 which I, uh, I'm not sure that uh, has, been, has been talked about yet, but it's a dynamic um, problem. Um, so it, it demonstrates the use of static fault friction, but step 10 is just like step one in that um, the displacements will not cause slip. So all I want, I don't want to test the fault friction solver I just want to test the elastic solver uh, with a given displacement along the fault. So um, what happened? So this is how you, so let's get into how to look at this stuff. It'll tell you it's going to start solving a set of equations. Now here, the first step um, is, a, is the nonlinear solver has started. Now this is a linear problem, but we're using a nonlinear solver. So it ought to uh, converge right away in one uh, nonlinear step, and it does, as you can see down here. Um, it, it takes 27 iterates to get there. So the question is, is that any good? Um, hmm. It doesn't show what solver we're doing. So the default configuration did not have KSP view turned on. So let's turn on the viewing so that we can see. And see, I'm giving a pet the options, nest view, and run it again. Oh, that's VI. Whoops. All right, okay, so now let's look at what we actually did. So we had. Um, a nonlinear equation solver, which is Newton with a line search, and it describes the line search. And, and then for each Newton step, we solve a system of equations. We solve it with GM res, but this GM res is preconditioned with additive Schwartz. So I think Brad talked to you a little bit about additive Schwartz. Um, what this is, is it's dividing the problem into blocks, and these blocks don't have to do with the equations, they have to do with the domain, so you divide the domain into pieces, and you solve each piece separately, and each of these pieces is being solved by this in incomplete factorization, this black box preconditioner. Um, and the difference between the J block Jacobi method and the additive Schwartz method is the block Jacobi method, the pieces of the domain don't overlap. But in the additive Schwartz method, I divide the domain into overlapping pieces and solve each piece. So we can look at the sizes we're dealing with. For this problem right now, um, we have 763 unknowns. So it's not a big problem. So 27 iterates is kind of disappointing. Um, and this is all of the uh, performance data. So we can add some options and the, the solver 01.cfg let's just show you that 
we say, well, what if we just went to LU to uh, sort of explore that? Let's try it. And it turns the viewing on, so I'll just. OK. And I would like it if this wasn't uh, this um, brutal of an error message. It should just say could not factor. So I'll fix that. But um, what happened is LU has failed. And it failed because we have zeros on the diagonal. And in fact, it's even worse. We didn't even create diagonal elements. It's just blank. And that's why this fails in such a spectacular way when it tries to generate an ordering, because the there's nothing there to order. So what we'd like to do is uh, we'd like to use what I told, what I said would be our version of LU. Um, this uh, this splitting. Well, um, yeah. So first we'll try splitting. Um, so the naive thing would be, well, okay, we can't solve this fully coupled. So let's uncouple it. Let's Let's just solve the uh, elastic part and the um, and the and the uh, fault friction part. So to do that, we can use an additive coupling, and we'll just use factorization on the on the elastic part. We would love to use factorization on the fault friction part, but um, there's nothing there because it, the fault friction doesn't have an equation; it's just a zero. The only way it participates is to couple to the elastic part. So we'll just put the identity, as we saw in the slide, the simplest preconditioner we can use. So what we do, what we have when we do this, is it's even worse. The situation is even worse. We take, we take 58 iterates instead of, uh, what, 27. So this, this decoupling of the problem was not great either. Uh, and you can see, so there's 658 elastic unknowns and 105 uh, fault friction unknowns, which adds up to 763. So we need, that didn't help us at all. So maybe instead of um, uncoupling them, what we'll do is we'll again use a coupled solver, the sure complement, but it allows us to use um, subsolvers for the pieces that we understand. So for the displacements, the elastic problem, we're going to use LU again. And for the Lagrange multipliers, remember, we couldn't use LU, but what we can use is an iterative solver and give it a very low tolerance. So here's what happens. We solve the elastic problem exactly with LU. We solve the fault friction, the coupled fault friction problem to a very, very low tolerance, sorry, here. And this imitates the exact solver. Uh, and you, can try, you, you, you might be saying to yourself, why don't you just do this on the outside of the other problem? The thing is, this problem that we're solving iteratively is much, much smaller, 105 unknowns, versus the 763 unknowns that you might try this on. So hopefully, this is a better option. So let's try this. OK, and I know it's a lot of stuff to look at. So here we see that instead of 27 un, uh, iterates or 58 iterates, this converges in one iterate. And this is exactly what I told you should happen. This is the, this is the exact solver for st saddle point problems. So what you can do is you can always use these solver settings on new fault problems in Pilot and get exact answers and not think about the solver. And this is always how you should start out, not thinking about the solver. Think about the solver after everything else in the physics is done, and you'd like to do bigger problems or, or run faster. And so we can, we can see again here that we have a GM res uh, object. It's preconditioned by field split. And, what, and the field split says, I'm going to do a full sure complement factorization. And uh, let's look at the different problems. The A00 block, or the elasticity block, is solved using no linear solver, just LU. 
the, uh, and notice how the naming scheme works. Options for this top level preconditioner use FS. Uh, options for the uh, elastic solve use the FS field split displacement. Options for the Lagrange multiplier solve. Here we see what the definition of a sure complement actually is. In our problem, A11 is zero. So this is B, B transpose A inverse B. It's a sure complement. Uh, and for this solve, we can give options like FS field split Lagrange multipliers. For instance, we can change the maximum number of iterates here from 10,000 to four or something like that by giving options with this prefix. And uh, this is just has a Jacobi preconditioner because we don't know much about this matrix. It's impossible to form this matrix because it has this inverse of the elastic block inside. Okay, so uh, we've done the exact thing, but um, that's pretty expensive. It relies on the factorization of this very large um, elastic block. So how can we uh, how can we uh, do things that are not quite as expensive? And so one thing we can do. Uh, so, if you look at this solve here that we just did, the elastic solve takes no iterations because it is a direct factorization. But remember that the solve here for the Lagrange multipliers is an iterative solve. It uses GM res and this very weak Jacobi preconditioner, which was all we could do. And so each of those solves for fault friction take 30 iterates. Now, we have developed a, a preconditioner for uh, this, a custom preconditioner for the fault problem. And when we do, when we try that pr uh, preconditioner in, on the problem, we, we decrease the number of iterates. Now, this is not as impressive. Uh, 30 goes to 24 and 25. But let me tell you that um, if you scale the problem up to uh, a million unknowns or or, or 100,000 unknowns, um, you're you're going to see a reduction of you know, maybe 700 iterates to 24 or 25. Um, and so the reduction will be quite drastic for the much larger problems. I guess I should show an example of that if we're going to instead of having you guys just believe me. But it is definitely true. You can see it. Actually, the numbers are all in our paper, uh, the JGR paper. And so this is this is a uh, credible uh, solver, although the full factorization is still somewhat expensive. So what can we do? Well, uh, we can, uh, let's see, what are we doing here? We can we can relax the tolerance to which we are solving the the problem for fault friction. Instead of you know machine precision 10 to the minus 11, we can solve it to 10 to the minus 5. Now, what are the consequences of that? So let's look what happens here. Well, instead of just one iterate, we take another iterate. Now, why is that? Well. Uh, it's because since it's not an exact factorization anymore, um, when we make it inexact, uh, we, we cannot get a solution to the whole problem since our solution to the part of the problem is, is off a little bit. So where we had um, 24 and 25 iterates, so a total of 49, now we have another iterate, but it only takes us 10 10 and 15 iterates to solve the subproblem. So overall, we've reduced 49 iterates on the Lagrange multiplier problem to 35. So overall, this is a win, even though we take one more outer iterate here. This is, these are the kinds of games you play when you start trying to optimize these solvers. There is no good theory that will tell you that one more iterate here wins because these go down this much. So the only way to do this is testing.
of, of the very short that I'm, I'm showing you. There, there is no theoretical guide, unfortunately, here, which is, is sad, but uh, true. So uh, I've just got to remember why these things work. I wish I could show you more of the, the slides. I guess I could go back to the slides for a minute and then come back. But um, next, what we could say is one of the things that is making each of these iterates that we're taking so expensive, these 35 iterates, is the fact that every iterate we have to, or, or is that at the beginning we have to factorize this huge elastic problem with LU and then solve the triangular factors at every iterate. What if we did something less expensive, like algebraic multigrid? So we'll replace our LU solver with algebraic multigrid. Now, LU is exact and algebraic multigrid is not. And therefore, we should expect to see uh, an increase in the number of iterations because we've replaced the exact solve with an inexact solve. So what happens? Okay, we did see an increase in the number of iterations. And in fact, um, what we see is not only is there an increase in the number of iterations here, but um, the whole definition of our linear system uh, is, is uh, off because uh, in, in this sense, we're losing precision uh, because our uh, definition of the matrix A is um, inexact. And so this causes us to take many nonlinear iterates because uh, we have to correct this uh, inexact definition. In fact, um, I, you can see in the slide that I think it takes 30 or something like that. And so no, this is not really acceptable. You can see we've, we've blown up the, uh, the number of iterates we take in the problem by a factor of at least 100. Um, and this is, this is one of the problems. This is what I wanted to show, that naively um, just making a, what looks like a simple approximation can result in a huge uh, reduction in efficiency. And, and this is what you have to watch out for. I guess I could let it run, but I don't, I don't care that much. It's going to converge. It's just going to take another eight iterates or something like that. So I'll just, I'm thinking about just killing it. Oh, that's right. It's harder to kill on my machine than I want it to be. Okay. Well, we'll just, we'll just watch it converge. It won't take much, much longer. So, so some of these kinds of approximations can be a little disastrous. I don't remember how many it takes. No, I guess I can. It takes 34. Okay, there we go. Killed. Uh, so what we can do to clean it up is to say, okay, we're not going to do LU. We're going to do algebraic multigrid. But remember, with LU, we didn't need any solver cleaning things up. But with algebraic multigrid, we might want to put in a solver. So we put in a solver outside and we clean it up to a very low tolerance here, just to show that I'm, I'm going to show you we can restore the behavior that we had before with LU by combining algebraic multigrid with a solver and a low tolerance. So right, we get back to this, we get back to this behavior where we only take uh, two or three iterates, or, or where am I? Here we go. So we get back to this behavior where we only take three iterates, um, and they're less expensive than the DLU, and, uh, well, not for this small problem, but they would be on a bigger problem. 
and uh, we restore our convergence. So you just have to be somewhat careful in making these approximations. So instead of going all the way to the algebraic multigrid, we go to, let me, show, let me see, where are we here? Um, we go to a algebraic multigrid combined with a GM res solver of a low tolerance here. And so then you can start saying, well, do you really need 5 times 10 to the minus 10? What if we give 5 times 10 to the minus 8? Is that enough? And you can sit here for days and days and do this. And, you know, we give you the tools so that it's not hard to do. It's just running a bunch of examples. Now, so that was the, so let me stop sharing here. And then let me go back and share this. Oh, there are two of them. I thought it would replace. Where's my, there it is. Okay, so what I, what I've just gone through is what, what is in these slides showing that you can, you can do this. It this does, does not converge because the preconditioner is not strong enough. So, oh, this is, these are the wrong slides. So it must be the top one that's right. Okay. So as we saw, the full factorization with LU uh, for this, for the elastic block, and a very accurate solver for the uh, for the fault frictions works in one iterant, and this is what everyone should basically start with. Um, and as we saw, you can add a user-defined preconditioner. This is is crucial for scalability, and so we go from here to improve numbers of iterates. It does get much better for bigger problems. Um, we can make approximations such as approximating the fault friction solve, or not friction, the, the fault uh, traction solve, and uh, you, oh, you get an overall win on the number of iterates. Um, we can take away LU um, and make it something like multigrid, which is much more scalable, but as you see here, it's a drastic loss for us because we take so many iterates. However, if you put back the uh, the accuracy with a linear solver, uh, with a linear solver, you can uh, you can restore the the good convergence behavior, and then you could of course play with this tolerance. 